We're in a two-week series. It's really three weeks. The first week was Ralph the Clown. Loves ki- God loves kids. Can you say amen? And um, next, this week, we're talking about God blessing our homes with love. And next week, we're going to be sharing about God giving wisdom in our homes. And let me just say this. We live in a sad time. We do. We live in a time where there's very little wisdom. And if you're just being taught or tutored by this culture about how to have a family or how to have love in your life, you're going to be, you're going to be led astray because the world does, has very little wisdom. And so the Bible has a lot of wisdom. Can you say amen? And so we're going to learn some wisdom from God. But um, how many people here want God to bless their home? How many people want God to bless your home with love? Somebody say, is there anyone that doesn't want more love in their family? I, don't, I hope nobody will raise their head. When I marry people, I, I, I say these words. I say, we encourage you both as you stand in the presence of God to remember that love and loyalty will be the foundation of a happy and enduring home. I say, a home must be built on the foundation of love and faith in each other that comes from God alone. I say you two are about to pledge yourselves to each other, to love each other as God has loved you. And that means commitment, commitment to love. And then I read 1 Corinthians 13, and it says this. It says love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Do you believe that? Do you believe that love will be the foundation of a happy and enduring home? Do you believe that it's love? Do you believe that a home must be built on the foundation of God's love? I hope you believe that. Do you believe and do you pledge yourself to the people in your family, especially to your spouses, to love them? Do you pledge to love them? Nobody? Just my wife. Honey, I pledge to love you. Okay, she actually wrote on my notes, you need to pledge yourself to love me. (laughs) Honey, I love you. I'll love you now. I'll always love you. I pledge it in Jesus' name. You need to love God. You need to love God as he has loved you, and you need to be committed to love your family. Somebody say amen. How many people know we all want love in our families? Okay. You might be the toughest guy. You might have the snottiest attitude. You might have sarcasticness, whatever that word is, up to your head. You might might be a grouch, but you know what you really want? You really want love. You know, boyfriend, girlfriend, I don't care what kind of facade you wear. Deep down inside, what we all want is love. But what we need is a revelation that wanting love doesn't bring love. Do you know what brings love? Bringing love brings love. Duh. Okay. You want to learn some God's math. The first part of God's math is you need love. The second part is you get love from God. The third part is that you have love. The next part is that you bring love and you give love. And then you get more love, more love to give. You want to know God's math? You don't have it. You need it. Go get it from Almighty God. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. You need to know that you have a responsibility to love your family. You also have the authority to bring love into your family. And you have the power. You're not powerless when love's concerned. How many people know very often we feel powerless? That's a lie of the enemy. If you're a servant of God, if Jesus Christ lives inside of you, you not only have the responsibility and the authority, you have love power. Everybody say, show me some love power. You got love power. And I'm serious. Biblically speaking, you have the power to love one another. That was a weak amen. (laughs) Now listen, you need to learn this. Most people see their family as that which is imposed on them instead of what they are called to create. 
You know, so people feel a victim. It's like, I wish syndrome. I wish my wife wasn't like this. I wish my children didn't act this way. I wish they were more kind. I wish they, and it's all this, it's this syndrome that, that, that you think your family's imposed on you instead of realizing that you're God ordained. Hallelujah. You're a love machine. You've got the power to, to, to see, and hopefully you'll get some wisdom next week on how to do this. But you've got power from the Holy Ghost to love your family. I was just a little better. You know, many people see themselves as a product of a dysfunctioning family. And let me tell you something. And you might think this is a bad word. I don't know how else to say it. But, you know, all our families are messed up. You know, we all come. Do you know what I mean? There's not, you know, you think about this. Adam, who were Adam and Eve's parents? And they messed up too. Okay, all of us, some way or another, come from a, some place of dysfunction, okay? But we're not victims of unhealthy love and lots of, we're not victims of a, a emotional bad habits. You don't, you don't want, listen to me, you don't want to be a product of your family, earthly family. You want to be a product of God's family. Let me tell you something. He is a father. I, he knows how to reparent us. That's a lot to chew on. But God wants us to create in our families a culture of love. And that will come as we reach up and receive love for him. Many people are waiting for someone else within their family to manufacture the love that they need. They're waiting for, for, you know, a husband's waiting for the wife to bring love into the family. The wife is waiting for the husband. The husband and wife, they have kids because they're waiting for the kids to give them all this love. Forget it. Hallelujah. (laughs) You know, when they tell you love you, you ask if they want the keys or $10. You know, it's one or the other. And um, I'm just kidding. My kids are not like that. Not like your kids. And um, all right. But we're waiting for someone else in the family to to magically produce the spirit of love. Let me tell you something. If you're a believer, I don't care if you're 2 or 52 or 102. God, if you're a believer, if Jesus lives inside of you, you go to God. You get filled with his love and you bring it home. Somebody say amen. (laughs) Hallelujah. Praise God. Yo. People feel like when they don't feel like their husband's loving them or their wife's loving it, they that giving them the love that they deserve, man. They, they are worthy of this love. They deserve it. Why isn't my family giving me what I, what, what I deserve? They feel like the fact that they don't get love when they want it, how they want it, that that gives them a license to hold the love that they have from giving it back to them. That, that, that's, that's headed to divorce. Somebody say amen. Help us. Help us. How, how many people think it's about a good time to look at some scriptures? Okay. Otherwise, I'm going to get myself in a whole lot of trouble here. Okay. There's five scriptures I'm going to, show, to share with you this morning. Actually, in this part of my message. Two are from Romans, two are from 1 John, and one's from Ephesians. Let's go to Romans chapter 5, verse 8 first. Okay. Listen, it's very powerful. It says, but God demonstrated his own love towards us. While we were sinners, Christ died. You know, it's very powerful. The Greek word here for love is, is, um, is agape. It's God's love. And God demonstrated his love towards us. Towards who? Towards us. Hallelujah. Where do we get love from? We go to God for love. Whose love are we looking for? We're looking for God's love. Hallelujah. If you're part of a family, you're part of that family to receive from God a love that comes from above and then give freely and sacrificially. Is there an amen in the house? Hallelujah. God demonstrated his love while we were sinners. Christ died for us. Hallelujah. Christ loved us while we were sinners. He proved his love for us while we were sinners. Hallelujah. And you don't want to love that guy until he shaves his beard. And you don't want to love that guy until he learns how to do this. Or wife, husband, you don't want to love that woman until she does this better or does that better or fixes this attitude. Jesus' love, the Bible love, God's love that's going to bless your family is a love that loves while they're still in their sin. I'm just waiting for them to wake up and then I'll be nice. First of all, you need to get saved again. (laughs) And you need to love them while they're a mess. And they need to love you while you're a mess. 
So, but God demonstrated his love while they were sinners. Christ died for them. Next scripture, 1 John 4, 19. It says, we love because he first loved us. We love because Jesus loved us. We love our families because Jesus first loved us. We love our spouses because Jesus first loved us. We love our neighbor, who's, you know them, because Jesus first loved us. Romans 5, 5. As a young believer, I memorized this verse and meditated on it and took God in my soul. It says, hope does not disappoint us because the love of God, everybody say has. has. Not will, but has been poured out within our hearts. Everybody say my heart. The love of God has been poured out in my heart through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. You need to get a new vision. Hello. You're not, you're not, um, you're not um, ready to die on some desert island because you don't have love. If you're a believer, Jesus has already shed his love for you. He sent his son. He proved it. He demonstrated. And he not only demonstrated his love on the cross, he poured out his love and the whole Holy Spirit in your heart. And if you're not feeling love, it's because you're not connecting with God. You're not meditating on Him. You're not thinking on Him. You're thinking about all the people that are against you and all the horrible things that have happened to you. But you need to open wide in Jesus' name and say, God, you fill me in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. God poured out His love. And again, it's a Greek word for agape, God's love. Ephesians 5.25 says, husband, love your wives. Again, it's God's love. It's agape love. Love your wife, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for him. Love is about giving up. Love is about demonstrating. Love is about sacrificing. Somebody say amen. amen. And then the last portion of scripture we're going to read is 1 John in this section 4.9. Listen closely. It says, by this, the love of God was manifest in us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. His love is in us so we might live through him. I'm not living through my wife's love. I'm not living through my children's love as much as those things, those loves are so precious to me. I'm living through God's love. Somebody say Amen. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. We love one another because God loves us so much. No one, verse 12, has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us. And his love is perfected in us. And this is especially true within our families. We love one another. We love our spouses, our children, whatever your family, whatever's part of your family. Why? Because God loves you and he's filled you with love. Remember, wanting love doesn't bring love. What brings love? Bringing love, right. We need love. We get love from God. So we have love because we got it from God. So we bring it or give it to others. And then we get more love. Somebody say amen. There needs to be this revelation that you need love from God. It should, you, you, you know, you're on your way home. You need, before you walk in that door, you need God's love. Pray about it. Say, God, you know, I'm really tired. You know, my boss was ticked at me today. And, you know, if I, if I just walk into this house, I'm going to start yelling at them. Because I, I know it's the house. It's probably not going to be clean, as clean as I want it. How many people know the house is very rarely as clean as you want it? You know, when you walk on water, it's hard for anybody to live up to your expectations. You know what I'm talking about? No. Amen. You know, so, you know, I'm, you're walking into the house. You're already exhausted. You're already ticked. Do you know what I mean? You know, the kids are making too much noise. You know, everything's not perfect. They're not supposed to be perfect. God has given you another opportunity to show his love. So before you walk in the door, you say, holy God, fill me with your love. And they say, fill me with your love and just name everybody that's in that house and help me to love them. Help me to see them. You know, we walk in the house and what do we say? See me. See what a bad day I had. See what problems I had. Appreciate me because I am the center of the universe. That's not love. That's you, but it's not love. You pray, God, from the moment I walk in that door, let me be a love machine. Let me show your grace. Is anybody here? Amen. 
In a, in a, in a few minutes, we're going to really study 1 Corinthians chapter 13 because that's what we're talking about. 1 Corinthians 13 describes that love. But before we do this, I have a parable. I, it's, I, 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 how many people know Jesus told cool parables? Well, I came up with the parable. Cool, huh? You're a pastor's a parable guy. That's right. And it's, it's called the parable of Theodore. Now, don't laugh at me. Look at you guys. You're already downing on my parable. I didn't even tell you it. It's the parable of Theod- Theodore. He's okay. Now, it could be told of, uh, of many different moms and dads, but this, this parable is, is about Theodore. Theodore was a young dad, and he was from Michigan. He grew up in the shadow of the Great Lakes. He came from a big family whose last name, I think, was a lot. A-L-O-T. I think his last name was a lot. You see, he made, his family made a lot of noise. They got together a lot, but they also seemed to fight a lot. They got mad a lot, complained a lot, yelled a lot. Now, this might seem like a lot, but they also held grudges a lot, talked about each other a lot. You might not believe it, but they also got into each other's business a lot, which brought a a lot of hard feelings. <sighs> As the story goes, everyone thought their last name was a lot, so do I. Back to Theodore, a lot. He got married to a beautiful girl named Chrissy, and they seemed to have a lot of love. They laughed a lot, <laughs> they giggled a lot. At first, it seemed like they had a whole lot of fun together. But Theodore was trained to be suspicious a lot and to get jealous a lot, sometimes even to say a lot of unkind things. Well, Theodore and Christy started to have babies, and yes, you guessed it, they had a lot of them. First came Larry and Laura, then Linda and Lisa. Don't forget about Leonard, Luke, Leo, and Levi. That seems like a lot, but you don't want to leave out Lily or Leah. Now, if you ask me, that's a lot. And they were still young with a lot left in their tank. The problem is, what's so funny about that one? No, I'm just kidding. The problem is that they were still, oh, I already said that. The problem is, although they talked about love a lot, there was still a lot of pressure, a lot of money problems. And remember, they had a lot of junk. You know what kind of junk. A lot of it. I mentioned it in the beginning of this parable. They fought a lot, got mad a lot, complained a lot, yelled a lot, held grudges a lot. They talked about each other a lot. They got into each other's business a lot, and they had a whole lot of hard feelings. It seemed like Chrissy was crying a lot. A lot. She was. Theodore found himself wishing a whole lot that things were different. Believe it or not, he even thought about leaving. A lot. He knew they started with a lot of love, but it seemed to be a lot of messy, messy stuff. And that made him feel like giving up and throwing in the towel. He felt like there was a lot to handle. Too much. For now, we're going to leave Theodore and Christine. We'll come back to them. We're going to leave them to wallow in their hot water. Ah, <sighs> I need a break. That was a lot. <laughs> Sorry about that. That wasn't in my notes. <laughs> Who here wants to learn how to have God's blessing of love in their families? Amen. You see, it has to be our goal to create a culture of love in our homes. We need to create a culture of love. So I am asking you to open up your hearts as we study 1 Corinthians 13. You see, in 1 Corinthians 13, in just these two verses that we're going to look at, there are things that love is, and there are things that love is not. See, we don't do the things that love is, and we say, oh, I love you. And we do a lot of the things that the Bible says love is not, and we think that that's love because that's how we defined it. To find it, and we need to get God's definition of love. So please, we're going to read 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 and 5. Please stand with me, because I'm going to ask you to read along with me as I read the Holy Word of God. And the translation's on the screen. Okay. Please read with me. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. Love does not brag. It is not arrogant does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered. Now we're going to read that again. This time I want you to put a little more expression into it. 
okay? I want you to read it with a little flair, okay? Are you ready? Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. Does not take into account a wrong suffered. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now, I like that God often keeps things simple. When in describing what love is, it only gives us two things that love is. And each one of these are in our, in our, our grasps. Each one, everyone here, whether you're a super Christian or a baby Christian, every one of us can, can manifest these two traits that the Bible says love is. The first thing it says love is, love is patient. Now you might not think that you could be patient, but you can. And the, the second thing the Bible says love is kind. Patience and kindness. You want to know what love is? Love is and love is. Can anybody here, does anybody need to come to the altar and repent? Because does anybody here manifest anything besides patience? And does anybody here speak things that aren't kind? Yeah. But that's what love is. Hallelujah. God is calling us to be patient and kind with one another. It's not that complicated. You see, no matter how much you provide and no matter how much you sacrifice for your family, if you're not patient and kind, it doesn't mean anything. You know, we have, we have dads and moms say, oh, I sacrifice everything for them and they don't appreciate me not one bit. What comes out of your mouth? How patient are you? How kind are you? That's what God calls love. Can anybody say either amen or out? Yes, yes you can. <laughs> you're not going to tell me which one it is. You're just scan, okay. All right. If you're going to have a goal to make love the culture of your home, then your words are going to have to be guided by patience and sprinkled with kindness. Can everybody say, help me, Lord? So there are two things the Bible here says in these two verses that love is, and there are seven things it says it is not. And I use more than one verse version of the Bible. So you're going to see that each of these seven have more than one definition or more than one word to describe what these seven traits are. Okay? And they, the different words came from different translations. So the first things love is not is love is not jealous or envious. Okay? Does anybody here ever deal with jealousy or envy? I know there was a season in my life that I did. It says, love does not boast or brag. The third thing it says, love is not ignorant, arrogant, excuse me, or proud. The fourth thing, love does not act unbecomingly or rude. You know, a lot of people think that God has given, given them a gift to be sarcastic. And they believe that it's a sign of their wit. And so they, they, they've developed a personality of sparring with people verbally. Everybody say that's not love. And even though people might spar back, and even though they might laugh, and even though you might get self-esteem from that, you don't know what's in their heart. And let me tell you something. Many of your jabs reach and affect them, even if they laugh or play back with you about it. Love... Love does not act unbecomingly or rude. It does not seek or demand its own. It is not self-seeking. Everybody say, Lord, help me, God. Not to be self-seeking. I'm part of a family to love. I'm not worried about being loved. Hello? It's not seeking for self. This one's a good one. Love is not provoked, easily angered, not irritable or touchy. Come on. How many people feel like you're a backslidden Christian now? Okay, join the club. I'm going to have a lot of counseling appointments this week. But love is not touchy. No matter how many reasons you think you have, you know, you think, you know, because you feel sick that that's okay to be touchy. Or because you're tired that you could be touchy. Or because it's your time of the month. And girls and guys have their time of the month too. That you're touchy. Let me tell you something. The reason you're touchy is because you're touchy. Let me tell you something. You can crucify that, that touchiness no matter what the reason is why you're touchy. And you can walk in love. You don't have to say the things that are coming to your mind when you're feeling touchy. You don't. You could speak the word of God. 
Amen. The seventh one is love does not take into account a long suffering. You know, how many people, when, when they're fighting, they say, I remember. Well, if you remember what, they, what you forgave them about two years ago, you're in sin. And you're not in love. How could any, hey, if any marriage or any family remembered, we're all fallen beings, we're all sinful beings. If anybody remembers everything that that person did wrong to, every time they forgot something, every time they didn't perfectly fulfill what they said, every time that they weren't perfect Jesus walking in the door, if you remember every time, none of our families can exist. Somebody say amen. Love keeps no record of wrong. Somebody say well, who? Keeps no record of wrong and is not easily offended. These are concrete things that love is not. And let me just say this. I want to encourage you when you see something in your life that, that is not what love is, crucify it. I learned this as a young man living in Pine Brook, New Jersey. I got saved when I was 16 years old. And I had a lot of junk. I had a lot of it. Just like my friend Theodore. And... um, um. And I, I had to learn to crucify that when I got angry or when I got jealous. I remember my whole life I felt like my parents loved my brother and sister more than me. They didn't. I felt it. Okay. How many people know that that's real? And how many people know? Am I the only one? How? Come on. Somebody help me out here. Okay. You know, I really felt, I felt like a second class citizen in my family. I, I felt like I was the least loved or the least appreciated. It could be because I got in the most trouble. And, um. Hey, I was just a scorny, skinny, scorny little punk. And, um, but I remember I got saved and I went from like a low C average to an, almost an A average. And I was so pumped. And I was asked to this award ceremony. And I thought I was going to get the most approved student of the year. And I got the worst award. It was almost embarrassing. I got the business department award. And the reason why I got the business department award, I didn't, wasn't in business and I didn't take business classes, is that my last semester I had some free time. So I used to go up there and help the ladies move the the. Um, the typewriters. That was back in the day when we had typewriters. You remember, remember the typewriter classes where you did pictures, you know, XOO, a stupidest drill in the whole world. And, um, but you made Abraham Lincoln. And so I didn't get the award because I was a good typer. I got the award because I had the time to help them move the typewriters. How many people know, like, that's lame. And, I, and you know what they got me? It was even worse. It was a cross pen. Now, how many people know there's not a seven? There, I don't care how nerdy I could have even, they could imagine I was. There's not a 17-year-old that cares about a cross pen. You know what I'm talking about. Does anybody, does anybody not know what a cross pen is? They're silver, you know what I mean? They're not real silver, you know, there's fake metal in a silver coating. And I got that cross pen. Well, that same year, my little sister, who I was already jealous of, okay, my older brother, who I was already jealous my little sister graduated from junior high school. It was in 1977, the year I graduated from high school. Well, they were having the, the graduation and giving out the awards, and they gave this award and that award and this award, and then it came to the biggest award, the one who was recommended by the guidance counselor, by the principals, by all the teachers, by all the classmates, the one that had it athletically. My sister did more push-ups than all, any boy or girl in her junior high school. The one that had it academically, the one that they know, everybody knew was most likely to succeed. And you know, then they called. Guess what? We're standing there, and sitting there, hundreds of people, and they call my little sister's name. She won the highest award for her graduating class. And everybody's patting me and saying, oh, aren't you so happy? Aren't you so proud of your sister? And outside I said, oh, that's so great. We're so happy. We're so proud of her. And inside I said, I can't believe it. I, I always, my, my brothers and sisters always do better than I did. I got a cross pen and she gets the highest award. I mean, I did that. Inside, I smiled. Oh, that's so good. And I hugged her and I hugged my parents. Oh, aren't you so proud? We're so proud of her. And inside I'm saying, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I was, I was so upset inside. I was envious and jealous. And I remember I, I was leaving. I, I was 17, so I had a car. And, um, and I, I sat in my car and I said, I said, my attitude is not love. And I said, Lord, I am not going to leave here until my attitude changes. And I started quoting scriptures. Lord, you said, you said in my heart, love and love is not jealous. I quoted those two scriptures. 
I, it took me, I, it was like 20 minutes to a half an hour. Everybody was leaving. I had my head down. I was holding the wheel, and I just quoted, Lord, I'm not leaving here until I have a right heart. I'm not leaving here until I love my sister because this attitude of jealousy is not love. And I quoted over and over and over again. And I, I, I realized I have the responsibility to bring love into my family. I could say, well, my parents, they said this about me or that about me, and that's why I feel jealous. No, I feel jealous because I'm not walking in love. Somebody say amen. Let's take responsibility for the areas in our lives that are not a manifestation of love. And let's conquer them. Hallelujah. And you know how much better it was that I got victory over that? And so when I saw my sister and really hugged her this time, it was sincere. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. We need to look honestly into our lives. Are we acting kindly or patiently? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. So if it's a, a no time, crucify that. Deal with it. Pray about it. You know, we let so many things go by in our lives without praying about it. If you're not walking in love, say it right then. Lord, this is not a love attitude. This is not a love way. God, forgive me. God, help me. And he will. Amen. You need to realize that if love is going to reign in your family, it needs to reign in you. As a married man, um, as a husband, as a father, I took this as a, a great responsibility to be an example of love, to love my wife and to, to love my children. And I thank God I married a woman who also has it in the goal to make sure that, that love is the culture of our family. Somebody say amen. Now, who here remembers Theodore? Anybody remember Theodore? Do you want to hear something cool? Theodore got saved. Hey, it's my parable. I can have anything happen I want. Theodore gave his heart to Jesus. And man, he got serious with God. I'm telling you, give Theodore a hand. Amen. Hallelujah. He got serious about following Jesus. And he learned that God wanted him to walk in love. And he learned that that meant God wanted him to especially love his family at home. He learned that God wanted to love his wife, Chrissy, as Christ loved the church. That's right, he learned that God wanted to love through him. He learned that God wanted him to be the representation of Jesus to all his ten children. And that God was giving him an opportunity to train them and teach them and help them grow closer to God. Can you say amen? Now you do remember that this Theodore had a lot of junk. Before coming to Christ, Chrissy was crying a lot and Theodore... Theodore wanted to leave a lot. Remember, they fought a lot, got mad a lot, complained a lot, yelled a lot, had grudges a lot, talked about each other a lot, were in each other's business a lot, had a whole lot of hard families, and they had a lot of financial problems. But when they came to Christ, hallelujah, they got a lot of forgiveness, a lot of grace, and a lot of mercy. Can somebody say amen? Hallelujah. And how many people know that the grace of God, hallelujah, that, that it covers a multitude of sins, and that's a whole lot of sin. They learned that Jesus not only bore a lot of their sins, but he bore them all. Somebody say amen. They learned that God was working in them both to will and to do for his good pleasure. They learned that God was calling them to forgive a lot. And they show kindness and mercy a lot. Amen. They learned that they were called to walk in 1 Corinthians 13 love a lot. They learned it a lot. And um, it's my prayer for each and every one of you that you learn that God has a lot of love for you. But you need to get it from God. And you need to be strategic and purposeful when you're not walking in love. And I believe God will bless your families with a lot of love.